I lost my only grandson to fentanyl poisoning. He um, moved in with me in January of 2021, him and his girlfriend and his brand new baby. And um, by, let's say, April 13th, he had purchased a Percocet, what he thought was a Percocet, and it was laced with fentanyl and it killed him. He was my stepson. I was married to his father, Keith, and we lost Keith to melanoma cancer in 2010 when Keith was 28 and Caden was seven. Caden and I stayed pretty close throughout the years after um, his daddy passed away. I'd still get him, you know, on those weekends or holidays. Um, we'd go on little vacations and weekend trips together. And I even took his senior pictures just a couple of weeks before he passed away. And so even up through his teenage years, we still stayed close to each other. Um, now, as he became a teenager and got older, hanging out with me and spending the night wasn't as cool as it used to be, but we would still find those activities or those connecting moments. We'd always go to his grandmother Julie's house for holidays, birthdays, events, and we, we still do that. My children, they're nine and seven, they call Julie Nana. They called Caden, that was to them their brother. They called him Bubs, I called him Bubs. So that's how Caden was a part of my life. He was experimenting off and on with drugs, yes. And um, I had caught him and I told him that he needed to stop. And I think he was probably self-medicating. We had had him um, to mental health professionals several times to try to get some help. And he said it never worked and he didn't like talking to the counselors and he just didn't think it was going to help him. And um, so he was trying to, I think, self-medicate per personally. Caden's dad, Keith, my son, got melanoma, skin cancer, and he passed away in 2010 when Caden was seven. And that was hard for him. That was another issue that he had to deal with, not having a dad and not having a great home life um, because of that. And um, so he had moved in with me a couple times. And then the last time he said, you know, can I move in with you? Can, can I bring my girlfriend and my baby? And I'm like, of course, I'm not going to leave y'all out on the street, obviously. And we had, um, I'd talked him into going back to school. He had quit school. And I talked him into going back to school and getting his high school diploma. And um, he had just finished and was waiting to walk across the stage with his um, class to get his diploma. And that hadn't happened yet. Um, and we had purchased tickets for the four of us to go on vacation. Um, we had been taking him to Mexico with me and my husband every year. And he had grown, grown accustomed to that. And he wanted to take his girlfriend because she'd never been out of the country. And so that's what we decided to do for his graduation present. And he passed before we got to do that. It's really surreal now to look back because my current situation, I have a wonderful husband and I have two wonderful children, but just a little over 13, 14 years ago, I had another family and my husband is now gone. And because of fentanyl, my stepson, my son, that is my boy. I may not have given birth to him, but that was my boy too. And he's gone and I'm mad. I'm mad because although we did get to see some justice in his case, those people were not held accountable for his death. They were only held accountable for the drugs and the paraphernalia and the firearms and the whatever else and the loads of money they had on them. Now our governor in Texas here 
has introduced a law that it will show fentanyl poisoning on these death certificates and that these terrible, awful people that are poisoning our children and that are poisoning our families are going to be held accountable. Him and his girlfriend, they drove over to a drug dealer's house and picked it up. DEA and uh, Parker County, um, Tarrant County, all came together and got enough information off of his phone and from his girlfriend and um, were able to track that guy down, watch him for a while, and he's behind bars. Not many people can say that they got at least that amount of justice. These families I'm talking about that haven't received justice for their loved ones, they must receive this justice. They need closure. They, they need time to heal and finding justice for these families. However, these people are charged, whether they're put behind bars for their drug possession or they're put behind bars because they're being held responsible for the death of somebody that they killed, that they murdered. These families need closure. We had mentioned before that the people um, that had sold these pills to this pill, one pill to Caden, um, they are behind bars and it is for drug possession. Um, I wish they would have been held accountable for his murder, but I, again, I'm so thankful that we did get that kind of closure because there are so many people that don't. I was very surprised at how quickly they moved on Cadence. I mean, it was crazy how fast they got them and got them behind bars. And we got not one, but we got two locked up because they also got the guy above him that sold to him. Um, and so he's locked up. And one of them got, what was it, like seven years, and the other one got like 10 years. 15 years, I'd have to look at my notes. But yeah, they're both, they both went away, federal, mm -hmm. federal prison, both of them right now. The girlfriend came and woke me up and told me that Caden wouldn't wake up. And so I got up and I went in there and I'm like, why are you trying to wake him up at 3.30 in the morning anyway? You know, but they're kids, they're teenagers, they're up all hours of the night. And so... I went in there, and he he's always been a kid that's been hard to wake up, and so I thought it was just typical Caden not, you know, waking up. And But then when I pulled his arm up and it fell back against the bed, I thought, mm, I might better turn the light on. And so I turned the light on, and his lips were blue, and then she started telling me she heard some gurgling sounds and... I pretty much figured he was already gone, but I, I, I think I went into shock because I didn't scream, I didn't cry, I didn't, I just was like, okay, we need to call 911, you know, somebody's gonna come and help us. And so I called 911 and I, she told me to put him on the floor and I'm like, you're crazy, I can't lift him, he's too heavy. And she's like, put him on the floor. And I'm like, okay, okay calm down, <laughs> you know, and so we got him on the floor and she started me doing compressions, which, you know, then I realized, oh no, my big dog is in the house and the, I've got paramedics fixing to come in the door. And so I had the girlfriend take over the compressions while I ran and put the dog in the backyard so they could come in the house. And then I took back over with compressions until they got there and then they shoot us out of the room after they worked on him for a little bit and then they took him out the front door with some contraption doing the compressions for him, for them, which was the worst thing in my life that I've ever seen. It was bad enough that I had to give my own grandson chest compressions, but then to see that machine, which looked like it was just so invasive, pressing against him. And we got to the hospital. I, I told the girlfriend, I said, okay, one of us has got to stay with the baby. One of us can go to the hospital. Still, I'm not thinking straight about what the consequences really are right now, even though I knew in the back of my mind he was gone. Um, and she said she'd stay with the baby. So I drove to the hospital. Well, my husband thought, smart enough, he stayed there with the cops, but he thought to call my son, um, 
And Jace and his girlfriend met me there. And thank goodness they did because obviously I, they came, they put us in a room, which I've been in that room before when my parents have passed away. You know, they put you in this separate room to come in and tell you that they're, they can't do anything else. He was murdered. He was given a pill and he was told it was a Percocet and it was not that. And he was murdered. He did not want to die. Every 11 minutes, somebody is dying from a fentanyl poisoning. He was experimenting with drugs and should have been taking a half of a Percocet and should have just made his headache go away or whatever he was taking it for. And instead, it took his life. I mean, and the one thing that I had heard through conversations with some of the guys that did the investigation was that the guy that sold him the pill had told his girlfriend not to take those pills because he knew they were laced. Six out of 10 illicit drugs in the United States contain fentanyl. This must stop. We are here to save our children. We are here to save lives. We are tired of funerals. We don't want this happening anymore. This is not a red problem. This is not a blue problem. This is a red, white, and blue problem. This is an everyone problem. This is going to take all of us together to save these lives. Kids don't get to be kids anymore. They, they can't experiment with drugs because they're gonna lose their life if they do. And they, they need to be told what the impact is and how it hurts families. And, you know, his baby now is two and a half years old and is going to grow up without a father, just like Caden had to. It's a ripple effect. It affects the families that are, are directly affected. It affects family members. It affects the children in their lives. My children loved their bubs tremendously. They loved him so, so much, and he loved them just as much. Uh, even though he was not their biological brother, none of them saw that him like that. I had been around Caden since he was probably three or four years old, and because of that and all the time we spent together, he really was my first son. Um, I call him my stepson because that's what he was, so there's no confusion, but that was my son. So many of us are going through so many tough things, no matter what it is in our lives. And, and, and one hardship is, is not any more or less important than the other. I have been able to get through these situations because of my mother-in-law, because of my mother, because of my friends, my family, my children. I have a huge support system. And a lot of these families out there don't have that. A lot of these families are not getting the support they need in order to get cases prosecuted. A lot of these families are not getting justice, and it's heartbreaking. These people that are doing this to our loved ones have to be held accountable. Our kids, our loved ones, they're being murdered. I am so thankful for every little bit of support that I've received throughout this, because without that support, I don't know how I've, I would have ever made it. I see a lot of families that don't have that support, and I pray for them because I know they're struggling and they need help. They need help getting answers on what happened to this child, what happened to their loved one, and what we can do to stop it.